Well, I want to start by thanking my brother Cody Hill for writing that song. That, that yeah. uh, blesses me every time we sing it. Uh, I'm going to continue in Isaiah chapter 31. So if you want to open your Bible to that, Isaiah 31. Then on the top of my notes, I say 30, but it's 31. I enjoyed 30 so much that I uh, kept referring back there. It's had an impact on my life. Last week from chapter 30, Chad talked about how our greatest joy is yet to come. And actually, if you look at chapter 32, it starts out with, Behold, a king will reign. And so we're constantly looking forward to, to what God's doing, going to do. And the question is, is how do we live today in light of that? So we, we constantly are trying to, to if you will, figure that out. We're because we're living it, right? We're living through times, and, and Chad brought it up, we're, we're living in times of, of trouble, we have enemies, sin abounds, and death. It's, it's our, all of our ends, right? So in the midst of that living that we're all doing right now, uh, how does this hope have an impact? And that's kind of what we're going to look at a little bit in Isaiah 31. But first, uh, I'm also a grandpa, so uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to this book, uh, Going on a Bear Hunt. <laughs> okay. and, and the reason is because it keeps coming to my mind, because they come up with various obstacles, you know, like a swamp or a river or mud or whatever, and they say you can't go over it, you can't go around it, you've got to go through it. And that's really kind of what I keep coming back to in Isaiah, is no matter what we're going through, you can't, maybe you can't avoid it all. And sometimes we try, don't we? We try to avoid it. We try to dodge it. We try to get, get around it, go over it, all that stuff. And he says, no, some stuff you got to go through. And that's kind of what we're dealing with. I, I, I got another kind of lighthearted thing. Here's a picture of some flowers, right? My wife will like this. Uh, those are beautiful. It's the sleepiest anybody cares. I know you don't. All right, but, but they're beautiful in our front yard. But about a month ago, they were just getting ready to bloom, and deer walking through our yard just bit off every bud. <laughs> Didn't de destroy the plant, just every bud, just every one of them was nipped off. We now have four times as many flowers as we would have if those deer had not walked through our, through our yard. And, and that's one thing, I, I guess, this is not the focus of our, of our time together, but that scripture, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And that kind of thing, that, that helps us to, to when we're going through tough times, or even good times, that there's, there's still more ahead of us, and it helps us to go through life and not get too distracted by what's going on. Yesterday was Independence Day. Maybe there was a little bit of fireworks in your life, you got to blow something up, or you heard your neighbors. We went out about 10.30 trying to catch some of the last ends of it. Um, I'm not that big in blowing stuff up, but I like to watch other people do it. But it was Independence Day, and obviously that's the beginning of our nation, the United States of America. And the Declaration of Independence is the statement that divided us from being a, 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 col a bunch of colonies, of British colonies, to being a nation. And it caused a big rift, as you might imagine. And the people who were there, actually, if you read the Declaration of Independence, when you get down a ways, you will start acknowledging, you'll see that what we're going through today in racial unrest actually was going on back there. That, that slavery was there, and it's shown, and it comes up in the Declaration of Independence. When it talks about property later on, because that's what slaves were to their owners, was property. But you also see in words like, like this, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from, from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And like I said, in the midst of this article, this declaration, we understand that slavery was going on. We also can hear in these words that they weren't all the people organizing this country were pro-slavery. You can hear it in 
all men are created equal. And also in that same context is that women are involved, included in this all men. But it wasn't the argument of the issue. It wasn't the argument of the day, if you will. The argument was with Britain. And that was the focus of what there was. And they weren't able to get everything accomplished at that time. But later on they were. And, and there's a, I'm going to go on to the next paragraph in the Declaration because it very much applies to what we're looking at today in Isaiah chapter 31. And some of you men were in a study recently and we looked at the word prudence and it starts this way. Prudence indeed will dictate that government long established shall not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Now that's some old writing, old English kind of writing there, but basically saying when we're in hard times, we are more likely to suffer when their suffering is sufferable than to push back, than to try to change anything. Right? And we all understand that. We see that in our life. We understand that there are things we go through that we just go through. And there are other things we stand up and we try to change. Okay? And that's what was happening back there. Now, what I want you to do is pay attention and think about our country in the context of what we're looking at in Isaiah 31. Okay? So now, you know, remember that this, this, this Declaration of Independence... You, you could say created a war, but actually the war had already started. There was already fighting going on when this declaration was made. But this really <laughs> elevated it quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I like uh, based on true war movies, right? Well, Patriot is, is a good one. I like some quotes out of it, okay? Like this quote says, Why should I trade one tyrant 3,000 miles away for 3,000 tyrants one mile away? Okay, that was one of the things. But he made a statement on He says, An elected legislature can trample a man's rights as easily as a king can. And we understand that. We see that in, in various ways. But the, the quote I wanted to really focus on, and I know it's a movie quote, but the truth of it is, is, is real in the, in the Revolutionary War. But again, it's true in Isaiah's time because Assyria is pressing down on them. This is what he says, This war will be fought not on the, foreign, on the frontier or on some distant battlefield, but amongst us. Among our homes, our children will learn of it with their own eyes. And the innocent will die with the rest of us. And, and, and do you get the sense of the danger, of the, the awfulness of war? Of, of this conflict, this, this trying to right a wrong creates a lot of pain and suffering. That's why it's sometimes better to suffer than to stand up for that. In, in the U.S. history, this, this is very relevant to our Isaiah 31 again, is in U.S. history, 1776, the, the Declaration of Independence was made, July 4th, of course. But did you know that on October, in October of 1776, Benjamin Franklin traveled by ship to France to try to create a, an alliance? You guys recognize that? Recognize that from Isaiah? He tried to create an alliance with France against the British. It took him almost two years, but he did accomplish that. And, it, and it's very clear that the help of the French ensured our victory over the British. It's an interesting parallel, isn't it? Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make with this, and, and you'll see this as we go through these scriptures, the things we're reading in Isaiah are not a fancy full fairy tale. But they're historical. And they're relevant to our history, as well as our current, as well as our future. The things of Isaiah are relevant to us. Uh, I, I mentioned some of this as serious stuff. I want to show a map here. This, is, this uh, map shows Israel is over here on the, on the left, kind of lower, lower middle, I guess it is, by the water. You can see Judah. <clears throat> and up here on the upper right is this dark green. That's Assyria. And this is early. This is uh, at the early time of the writing of Isaiah, the very beginning of it. Uh, but this next one shows the expansion that happens. And you see that growth. And this is about the time that Isaiah is writing uh, chapter 31. You can see that, that they expanded to, to the east, and now they're expanding down. They're, they've taken Damascus, and they're getting, moving into to the northern king, kingdom of Israel. We know they're going to take that 
here very shortly. That's the context of, of Isaiah 31, that, that Assyria is pressing on them. And that's why you're going to read these things. Let's turn to Isaiah 31. Let's just read the whole chapters. Not very long, nine, nine verses. Isaiah chapter 31. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and does not retract his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of the workers of iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. And the Lord will stretch out his hand, and he, will, and, and he who helps will stumble, and he who is helped will fall. And all of them will come to an end together. For thus says the Lord to me, as the lion or the young lion growls over his prey, against which a band of shepherds is called out, and he... He will not be terrified at the, their voice, nor disturbed at their noise. So will the Lord of hosts come down to wage war on Mount Zion and on its hill. Like flying birds, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will pass over and rescue it. Return to him from whom you have deeply defected, O sons of Israel. For in that day every man will cast away his silver idols and his gold idols, which your sinful hands have made for you as, as a sin. And the Assyrian will fall by a sword not of man. And a sword not of man will devour him. And he will not escape the sword. And his young men will become forced laborers. His rock will pass away because of panic. And his princes will be terrified at the standard declares the Lord whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Father God, I, it's exciting to hear these words of, of what you're doing. You, you've pointed out their error. You've pointed out the futility of their plans. And yet you've lifted up and showed how much you care about them. A, a particularly, particularly about Jerusalem, you have an amazing thing going on here, Lord. And we get a glimpse of it. Help us, Lord, to see what you're doing in our lives, how this applies to us today, and, and help us to walk in the things that you, you were concerned about them at that time. Help us to be faithful, that we might receive all the blessings you have. We might escape all the, the, the trials, <clears throat> that we might be able to endure whatever you allow to come upon us. To you be glory. May you find us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's break this down a little bit. These first three verses, uh, verses 1 through 3, are the woe. It's pointing out what, they're, what the woe is about. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. And, and again, remember, you, you see that, that big swoop of, of uh, another nation coming down. And they've been just slaughtering people. This isn't just a pretty campaign where they just, hey, will you come to our side? No, they're slaughtering people, taking them by force. Okay, and they're coming down and you'd be afraid. We would be. The leaders are afraid. It makes sense what they're doing. It makes sense that they would look to Egypt for help. Egypt is big. It's powerful. It's got lots of men, lots of horses, lots of chariots. It makes sense. Just like other nations look to the United States right now for help because we're big, we're powerful, we've got stuff. But there's something wrong with this plan. And he points out, but he, but he, but he says here what they're trying to do is they're relying on horses and they're trusting in chariots you see that again in a war situation it makes sense but wait a minute he, he's pointing out there's something about this that's different and what it is is that they don't look to the Holy One of Israel and they don't seek the Lord and that's why for us, if you, really, that's the whole foundation of this passage. Is that right there? When we bring things into life, what are we doing? Are we going to other things? Or are we putting God first? And, and are we looking to... And think about it. Look at this. I'll, I'll do, this is an assignment on, on the side. 
Holy One of Israel. Do you know that this is said 31 times in Scripture? 26 of them in the book of Isaiah. And one of the other ones, one of the other six, is about Isaiah. Something in Isaiah makes him say the Holy One of Israel. That it doesn't move other people to. It's worth looking at. Because what he's telling us to do, he's telling them to do, he's telling us to do, look, look to the Holy One of Israel. Not just the God of Israel, but he specifically says Holy One of Israel. And, and you think of, I mean, immediately some thoughts come to mind, but that's what I want you to do is pray, meditate, study. Why is he talking about the Holy One of Israel? So he wants us to set our eyes on him. But then he also talks about seeking the Lord. And when you talk about Lord, we're talking about somebody who is over us, who has authority over us, who can tell us what to do, and he tells us to seek him. And just like they're running down to Egypt, right, for help, there's something that he says, instead of doing that, run to the Lord. Seek him out. Sometimes, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, sometimes he's hard to find. I'm studying these words, I'm praying over things, I'm agonizing, Lord, I don't, I don't know what's going on in me. I don't know what's going on with others. I don't know what's going on in this world. I don't know how to respond. I'm trying to figure it out, and I'm looking here, and I'm looking here. Lord, talk to me. Hear me. Come on. Hear my voice. You can hear David praying the same thing. Sometimes he's hard to find. Are you willing to seek him, seek him, seek him, seek him? Look under rocks. Look under trees. Look under the book. Look in people. Try to understand. Try to seek him out. That's what he's calling us to do. Look to the Holy One of Israel. Seek the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. There's, there's the thing that's different here in this passage is, is he talking about you look to uh, Egypt. You're looking to them because they're many and they're very strong. But there's something different about God. And it br is brought out in verse 3 that he's wise. That's what you, you think about. What, we're, what are we looking for in life? We're looking for wisdom. We're looking to, to discern from all this information, these people attacking, these people that can help, and all these things, Lord, what, what's right in your eyes? What is the wise way to go? Because we don't know the future like he does. What's wise for us? What's good for others? What's good for these? What's wise? And, we, and really what we're looking for is discernment. I've got all this, these different pieces of information. Goodness, this coronavirus has been all over the place. You've got information here, information here, and it's always bouncing around. Wisdom and discernment was constantly the seek. That's what I'm seeking. Lord, help me. And I think it's true in all of our lives, in every aspect of our life. And that's what he's saying. You've got a lot of things you can run to, but first, look to the Holy One of Israel and seek the Lord. Because he's wise, and that's what you're pursuing from him. The other thing is, it's, it's in this. Do you get this? He's got a plan. He's got something he's going to do. And it really is not dependent on what Israel does. Or, excuse me, Judah specifically. Israel in the northern kingdom, Judah in the southern kingdom. It's not dependent on him. He's got a plan before he, it all happens. He's going to do that. Let's go on to verse 4. Because this is where... He says something of what he's going to do and where his heart is. You get to know God. Remember, that's what a lot of our seeking of God is. Get to know him. And then we can respond accordingly. Because that's really, this is the insight that can speak to the Israeli, or the, the, the Judah, people of Judah. They are Israelis, but specifically the nation of Judah. Because in verse 4 and 5, he says, As a lion, or the young lion, growls over his prey, against which a band of shepherds. Think about this, a, a, a lion laying over his prey. He's got his prey here, and he's laying over it. What typically will happen is shepherds will come and try to shake, scare him off or kill him, right? And God is saying he's like that lion over his prey. And he's not scared by the shepherds. He's not being driven away. He, he says later on in that passage, he's like a bird circling above. Remember, we talked about being under his wings earlier, just a few, few weeks ago. But God's like this lion, and he's not afraid of the shepherds. And, and he's referring to the Assyrians, isn't he? Now, you know, did I say this? Assyria is a tool in God's hand. Even at this time. God's doing something through the Assyrians. And yet God is over Jerusalem. He's saying his heart is for Jerusalem, Mount Zion, and on this hill. He's, he's saying, I'm going to protect this. It's funny because, remember I saw that, I showed you that map, and I know what happens. I've read more here because uh, 
the nation of Assyria, show that map, that's here, okay? You see how they're pressing up against Judah. What's going to happen is, is they're going to go and they're going to sweep on down. They're going to take Egypt. He's already said that. But I was laying in bed one night and I thought, I'll bet there's a map out there that shows everything engulfed in Assyria except one little circle where God is laying over Jerusalem. And I found it. I, was, I, did. I got up the next morning and I just go to Wikipedia. Now, first of all, not every uh, map shows it like this. But that's exactly what happened. And even if you, you go to the historians, and this is a challenge on history, whose history are you going to believe? Because it gets changed. Because you read about Sennacherib's history, and he's got a little bit different twist on it, on how things went. But what we do know is Hezekiah, which we're going to get to chapter 36, 7, 38. Hezekiah was left in place. When Sennacherib went back up to Assyria, when he back to Nineveh, okay, he left Jerusalem alone. He didn't kill their king like he'd been doing in every other place. And that's kind of the picture that God's laying over. This is amazing. And it shows God's heart. What was he telling? What was God telling the people of Judah at that time? He was telling them to resist. Hold. Wait. I got this. Stay here. Don't run to Egypt. Stay here and resist. Okay? That was the message you know, remember, we know that they've been wicked. Uh, the, the nation of Judah has done all the evil even the northern kingdom has done. And by the time this all gets washed out and the things we're going to read in 36, the northern kingdom will be taken over and obliterated never see them again. Okay? When Assyria takes them over. And that's Sennacherib's father that does that. Okay? The, the point here is that it's not too late to do what God is calling you to do. In, in verse 30, 31, verse 6, chapter 31, verse 6, he says it very clearly, return to them. Isaiah is saying it on behalf of God, return to God. Return to Him from whom you have deeply defected, O sons of Israel. The sons of Israel had walked away from God. And He could, and He is, He's pressing on them hard with the Assyrians. That's why the Assyrians are a tool in God's hand, is to discipline them. But it's not too late. And that's true with us. There's times we might be disciplined by the Lord, even harshly. But he says, not too late. Return to Him. He's calling us to do that. Now, he goes on in verse 7 through 9, for in that day, there's that word, in that day. And he's talking about when all these things in 36 happen, chapter 36 happens. For, for in that day, every man will cast away his silver idols and his gold idols. So there's part of the sin, by the way, that's going on. Uh, which your sinful hands have made which you have sinned, and the Assyrians will fall by a sword, not of man. Incredible story. I hope you're looking with anticipation to go home and read 36, 7, 38. We'll get there in a few weeks. I'm not even going to go into that anymore. It's, it's just so cool. It's so cool. Uh, and then he goes on in chapter 32. Behold, a king will reign. He's talking about Hezekiah, but you can also hear Jesus Christ in that as well. I want, to, I want to turn now and I want to take those passages and look at a little bit more application for us. I've hinted at it a little bit, but I want to dig into it a little bit more because we, we know that that day is coming, but it's not here yet. So how do we live? How, how should we live? How do we respond to trouble, enemies, sin, death? Well, well first of all, you, you and I both know we've already responded improperly lots of times, okay? But he's, he's calling us to, to something. So we're trying to discern that wisdom and know what it means. What do, think about this question, and, and this might be good. This might take you some time to examine yourself. When, when trouble or sin or difficulty or whatever it is comes upon you, what do you run to? What do you look to? What's your natural response? Probably, and, and, and it's, it's understandable, probably most of us don't first look to the Lord. Probably. Now, I, I believe he's calling them to repentance to train them, and it's a part of that, the training aspect of discipline. Discipline, is, it might be difficult 
But the intention is to train us in something, and he's trying to train us to where when something happens, positive and negative, we first look to the Lord. Give him praise, ask for help. Okay? So what do you now run to? And, and you may go over the next few weeks with this question in mind and kind of observe. What was my first thought? Did I first go to food? Did I go to something else? Did I go to movies? Did I go to a person? What do you run to? In Isaiah 30, verse 1 and 2, this was read last week, but it applies here too. Woe to you, rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine, and make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Okay? So, so somehow when we make our plans, when we make alliances, when we proceed down, are we bringing God into this is the question. Or are we just thinking about what's wise? Because like I said, in the case of Isaiah 30, it made sense. Everybody would say that it made sense to look to Egypt for help. Totally makes sense from a human standpoint. So think about this, applying this uh, to us as a people. First, let's start at a nation. Again, it makes sense to form alliances with nations. We do it as, a, as America. We, do it, we did it at the beginning with France. We do it on an ongoing basis. It's a little different now because we're the ones they're typically looking to. But we're also looking at making alliances with smaller countries so they don't make alliances with our enemies, right? We're doing all that, that kind of stuff going on. We also, money is a big part where we're looking to finances to solve our problems, to address things. We're looking to bigger and better weapons, but we're also looking to new frontiers. Space is constantly that idea. What about as a church? We're going to talk about it a little bit tomorrow night. We, we have national alliances. We have regional alliances that we do. We align ourselves with groups. Campus, we're going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow night. Campus Vintage Faith students can, can going to align ourselves with campus fellowship to, to do some work. Local pastors here in Manhattan, I get together with them a couple times a month to pray, and it's, a, it's an alliance of pastors to help one another. Even the information John communicated about the health director came from communication another pastor had. You know, there's, there's help in that, and it makes sense. We, churches get a, into associations with colleges and seminaries and things like that and create relationships there. Families do the same thing. Just think about schooling. You may homeschool, but typically, you know, I was the president of our homeschool organization here in Manhattan for a while. There's associations of homeschools, of private schools, public schools. K-State's part of what? The Big 12. Right? You see there's all kinds of associations that go on. Um, you are all part of a family, but you individuals, you also associate with the church, Vintage Faith Church specifically. And, and even if you're not in the building, You've associated, you've chosen to associate with us. You've made an alliance with us you know, in various ways. In individuals, when, when things come upon us, again, we're looking for direction in our life, we look for work, don't we? It might be when we get pressed on, we look to work to solve the problems. We get busy. It could be that we're turning to alcohol and drugs, both legal and illegal, right? To, to address the problems in our lives. It could be entertainment, could be sex, could be guns. Hey, think about that. You, you watch the gun purchases based on stresses in the world. Because we think that they're going to help us and protect us. And again, in part it makes sense. Just like Egypt did. Could be, again, we can run to education so we can have better reason, better... We, have, we know the experts, we can quote them. We can also look to science to explain things. I've already mentioned a few weeks ago turning to doctors in times of physical ailments. But, but I want to kind of think about what he said here in Isaiah of comparing the many and the strong to the wise. And, and that's the, 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 the thing that God is getting at. He's wanting us to look to him for wisdom and discernment, not just to strength and numbers. A lot of us just want to, hey, there's, most people are doing this, so I'm going to do that. Guard yourself against that. There's more wisdom there. Let's look at this fleeing to Egypt a minute. Okay? I want to look at this because there's some passages. Isaiah chapter 30, 31. I mean, really, a lot of this. It's talking about an enemy who is Assyria. Right? And God tells them through Isaiah, who is the messenger, God tells them, 
Don't flee to Egypt. Stay and resist. That's what he tells them through Isaiah. Right? Don't run to Egypt. But in, but in Jeremiah, for 42 and, and really a lot of other places, uh, Jeremiah, he's, the enemy then is Babylon. They come in after Assyria. And God says, don't flee to Egypt. Stay and surrender. Different message, slightly. But he tells them something different. Matthew chapter 13, the enemy is Rome, specifically Herod. And God says, he, and in this case, God says it through an angel of the Lord into Joseph in a dream. He says, flee to Egypt. Remember, he says, for out of Egypt, I will call my son. I, I've, I've described this like, I've described life like this. Life is like a river and you're in it and it's taking you somewhere. By default, it's taking you somewhere. You're, you're, you're going. Sometimes. You have no choice. You have to go with the flow. Like Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, where he is sold into slavery and taken to Egypt. He had no choice. Other times, it's an obvious choice. Swim to the bank. Right? It's like Genesis chapter 46, when Jacob, who is Israel, his son is now his second in command in Egypt, and he's in the midst of Jacob, is in the midst of a famine in Canaan. He's, he's going to go down to Egypt to be with his son to get the provision of the Lord. It was obvious. Sometimes you need to swim against the flow of the river. And that's what Moses did. And that's what Isaiah did. And that's what Jeremiah did. They were swimming against it. Against it. But here's where it gets tricky for us. Only a few people in, in these scriptures you know what I'm talking about, only a few people heard the word of God. Like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses. They're the ones who heard the word and they communicated it to everybody else. Right? Their voices, Isaiah's voice, and specifically in Isaiah 31, Isaiah's voice was there to the people. Right? To hear the word of God. So he spoke it. Jeremiah spoke it. It was interesting, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah's case, they told him, the people said, Jeremiah, seek the Lord and tell us what he says. We'll do whatever he says. So he does. He goes to the Lord. Jeremiah, the Lord tells Jeremiah what to tell them, which was stay in, in Jerusalem and surrender. They said, no, we don't want to do that. And then they fled to Egypt. You see what I'm saying? They, they heard the word of God, but they chose not to do it. And, and that's the thing is, is that the voice of God was there for the people, even though they didn't hear it directly from him. The people that God sent were there. But let me say this. The other voices were also there, but they were wrong. The voice of people telling them to do something that was not from God was there as well. Again, it would make sense for all these people to get together and say, we should do this, it seems wise, while God is saying, this is wise. Who are you listening to? That's again another one of those things you're going to do over a few weeks. Maybe the rest of your life. Who are you listening to? Very few of you, very few of you will hear directly from God in a vision, or a dream. Very few. Many of you will hear from God through the apostles and the prophets of Scripture. Many of you will. Most of you, now all of you here and listening, we hear the word of God through people, through maybe sermons, maybe conversation. But most of us are going to hear the word of God, the truth of God, the wisdom of God from people. But all of you, all of us, will hear wrong words telling us what we should not do as though it was right. They will tell us what, we, what God is against, saying it's still what we should do. They're trying to tell us that which is wrong. And that's why you get it. I mean, you guys are deluged with information far more than my generation was. That's why it's so important to have wisdom rather than smarts. It's wisdom more than science, wisdom more than anything else. And the only place you get that wisdom is from God, the Holy One of Israel, and the Lord by seeking Him. 
Now, what I've also said is Egypt is not the problem. Did you get that? God may very well send you to Egypt. He may tell you to, to go to that school, do this thing, make that alliance. He may tell you that. Just like he sent Jesus. Just like it was actually his provision to send Joseph. Do you get this? Egypt is not the issue. All these things we can align ourselves with are not the issue. The issue is, are we seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? That's the issue. And, and all of this, you know, how do you, how do you figure this? It begins with the fear of the Lord. I, I, I've been in conversations recently where it's, it's obvious there's no fear of the Lord in the people. So they don't really care what he says. But this, these, these stories and passages, this history tells us we must. We must have a, the proper respect and honor and fear of the Lord in his power and his might. We must. And out of that, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I read that somewhere, right? You get, now we're, we're beginning on that walk of wisdom. But then it's look to the Holy One of Israel and seek the Lord diligently. In light of all this, I'm encouraged that we don't have to go over it. We don't have to go around it. We can go through it. But we've got to do it close to Jesus. That's, that's the whole. And it, and it sounds silly, but isn't that what he's calling us to do? Walk through life close to him. Not going off and doing our own thing and saying, see you, Lord. But close to him. Calling him. Looking to him. Seeking him. Walking with him. That no, obviously means obeying him. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you for all of your encouragement in the scriptures. Thank you for the history that's here, but also your heart that's laid out like a lion over its prey, like a bird hovering. You will protect Jerusalem, Lord. You will protect your people. No one can snatch us out of your hand. Lord, I, I, that is so encouraging, and yet it, 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 there's so many voices, and, and thank you for reminding us to, to, to take those voices before you. And to, to look for discernment, wisdom. Like I said in James, you will give it to us. Lord God, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the encouragement. Bless this group of people. Help us to walk in your ways uh, t to your end. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me, let me send you off with this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power of that works within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Have a glorious week. God bless you all.